Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Ladder Through Research Fails. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking, as you can probably tell by this uh, beautiful image here, about the space shuttle. So the most common uh, claim that ladder Earthers make about the space shuttle is that it clearly has um, jet engines because of the noise it makes at landing. And enough people have debunked that already, whether it be like... Uh, there's more than enough reason for it to be making noise uh, from the turbines that are used to generate electricity. It's not... It, it, it's not completely unpowered, it just means it, there is no thrust. Um, then there's also the fact that it's a large body moving through air at uh, very high speeds that also makes noise. And also that it was escorted by jets. So yeah, no, no sign of conspiracy there. However, there's a, an accompanying uh, claim with this that a lot of them say it cannot possibly glide down because it's a very very bad glider it's designed is nothing like uh like most gliders that you see around and in this case and this will cause me physical pain to say but they're actually right but then it's like okay so how does this count as a research fail well they are right that it is a bad glider but then they just simply jump to the conclusion that it therefore has to be fake. Instead of saying like, okay, then how do they compensate for this uh, design that is not optimized for gliding? Because we have to remember in the end, it's technically not a glider. It's a spacecraft that glides down to landing. So its design, its main function is still around being a spacecraft. And so basically the question is, is it good enough at gliding to get safely on the ground? And that's where we we're going to go. So I must say this, I'm going to go into unnecessary detail in this explanation, but I also want to illustrate another point that uh, you never see flat earth use, and it's really a must when you are uh, analyzing different aspects of physics and forces acting in an object. So let's go. So you see, this is a free body diagram. Uh, and basically what it is, you start with um, any object at its center and you put it in any inertial reference frame. And what the purpose of this, uh, of the free body diagram is to then illustrate all the forces acting upon uh, a certain object and if you have uh, the numbers for specific examples you can then uh, work out the math to see if the numbers uh, basically the addition of the forces if it's going to move in one direction or another so let's say if you want to uh, calculate whether an object uh, stuck to the side of a rotating sphere, if it should be thrown away because of the centrifugal force or not, well then just make a free body diagram of all the forces in play, and I do mean all the forces, don't complain that one of them is imaginary. Anyway, so this one we're going to have a plane, and at first we're going to start with a plane at cruising speed and altitude. Uh, and that's because at this point all the forces acting on it are in equilibrium. Now I'm going to go into aerodynamics, which is not my strongest suit, but um, so I'll keep it uh, simplistic. In a lot of this case, I'm going to oversimplify things quite a bit. So anyway, this is our this is our plane in in the center, and as it's flying around. Remember, it's an inertial reference frame, so right now we're counting zero as uh, also its uh, cruising speed. So we have four main forces acting on the aircraft. Over here, we have the lift that's generated by the wings. And uh, basically, so this is the equation for lift. Uh, we'll have times uh, this is the 
density of the medium it's lying, so in this case air, which of course uh, varies with height, so the lift generated by a plane at different heights and speeds will vary. Uh, it also depending on the squared of the speed, now this would be the airspeed. Uh, the area of the wing, and then this is the lift coefficient that uh, I'm not going to go into this, it just basically depends on uh, the angle of attack of the wing. So yeah, this is um, the main equation. This coefficient is where you can probably teach an entire course on uh, properties of different shapes of wings and everything. But the general thing that I want to go for them is the larger the area of the wing, the more lift it's going to produce. Uh, then countering that is the force of gravity. Now, I don't want to get into the debate of gravity or not, but I think we can all agree that uh, if a plane suddenly loses its wings, it's going to fall out of the sky. And also we can agree that uh, the m more massive an object is, the harder it, it is to hold over your head. So uh, forget about what causes it or anything, just big object without wing going to fall. That's all we need to do, know for this explanation. Uh, then, of course, since it's moving in the medium of air, uh, that medium is going to generate a resistance against that movement known as drag. So you'll actually notice it's quite um, similar to the equation of lift, but of course this case uh, it's acting uh, against the direction of motion. Oh, as yes, I also mentioned, lift, it's not always like straight up, it's just perpendicular to the plane of the wings. So if the airplane here were instead of nosing 45 degrees up, like say it's takeoff, the lift is actually going to go 45 degrees in this direction. Uh, just pointing that out. So now here, yes, also have, this is the same uh, density of air we have here. This area is actually the cross-sectional area, which means basically the area the plane occupies when viewing it head on, because that's the area encountered by the, by the atmosphere as it's moving through it. Uh, this is also drag coefficient that I'm not going to go into basically, even with the same area, different shapes can have different drag coefficients and also dependent on the squared of the velocity. So the faster the plane is going, the more drag it's going to experience. And finally, we have the thrust uh, provided by the engines. I'm not even going to bother with that equation here. It depends a lot on the engines. It's just like also the throttle setting and everything. Just, yeah, an engine produces thrust. It pushes the aircraft forward and so. And yeah, it's also like the lift force, it also depends. I should mention that uh, it's not always like, the drag is not always in, in the horizontal towards the back, it's just against the uh, velocity vector of the plane, and the thrust is just pointing like towards the front uh, of the airplane. So what does this mean in terms of energy? Well, usually in these systems we uh, we talk about um, two different kinds of energies. The kinetic energy basically is like here half the mass times the mass of the object times the velocity of the object squared. And you have the gravitational potential energy. Again, I don't really want to go into the whole gravity fake thing, just th th there's a potential otherwise uh, an object just letting go of an object and having it accelerate would mean there's an increase of uh, kinetic energy without any decrease in potential energy, cr essentially creating energy and violating laws of thermodynamics, like the conservation of energy, it's basic. So call it what you want, but you have a potential energy that depends on the mass of the object, uh, the gravitational acceleration, and the height. Now, I must say, this is a simplified uh, uh, equation for for the gravitational potential energy that assumes a constant acceleration uh, within the heights involved. It's perfectly okay to use it with airplanes, 
since um, usually the like with the full uh, potential energy equation it's from the center of the earth and uh, the what 15,000 meters operating range of most aircraft there's not going to be a lot of difference compared to the uh, the thousand kilometers thousands of kilometers of the earth's radius so uh, and actually when we go to the shuttle uh, it's sort of in the gray area because now it's uh, it's around 400 kilometers which uh, I think the gravitational acceleration over there is 90 percent uh, of the acceleration at the surface but I'm not going to actually be doing uh, any number crunching right now it's just to illustrate a point so this works so anyway uh, if I'm not if an airplane uh, is at cruising speed like constant constant speed and altitude then it starts nosing down without changing its throttle it's going to start going down losing potential energy and it's going to start accelerating increasing kinetic energy now the catch thing that is that if this is not a closed system uh, the as it moves through the atmosphere the force of drag which is why I left it here is a way that the, an aircraft loses uh, energy it transfers energy to the atmosphere via heat and sound and uh, it replaces that energy with the thrust of its engines basically changing the chemical energy found in the fuel into a thrust um, and yeah it's all about finding that balance so this is where it, we get into the glider problem so you see for the glider we don't have thrust so th at the moment yeah a glider gets to its starting altitude and speed by whichever means it is and once it's uh, let go it has just a limited amount of energy until it has to touch down so it's a huge energy conservation uh, problem so then what you want to do especially gliders I th I'm guessing most gliders at least nowadays are designed more for um, like pleasure purposes so the idea is to minimize the en energy loss due to drag uh, per time as much as possible so that it can stay in the air the longest amount of time so basically you need to reduce the drag as much as possible and let's see how it do that so this is just a diagram of a glider that uh, i pulled off the internet and well we'll notice a few things most noticeable thing is the huge wingspan that basically how as we saw earlier the larger the wing area the more lift it produces therefore it won't need to go at as fast before stalling all aircraft uh, depending on their their aerodynamics there's at some point uh, certain speeds also depending on the uh, atmospheric pressure of the height they're in but at some point they're going to uh, n they're not going to produce enough lift to stay uh, airborne and basically lose out of control so yeah you have a huge wind span uh, reducing its stall speed so if an aircraft is able to glide uh, slower then we saw that the drag speed also depends on the squared of the speed so gliding slowly minimizes the drag they're also very sleek which uh, makes the the uh, drag coefficient of this particular design quite effective and minimizes the drag a lot and yeah those are basically the two main uh, things that we need to consider here so now let's compare it to the space shuttle like i said there the flatters are right that it's not designed as a very good glider now a key thing to notice here is that it's not that uh, you caught NASA saying it's a good glider and it's not like they openly say that it's a very bad glider in fact the astronauts 
lovingly refer to it as the flank brick. So there, it's it's not a big secret or anything. You did not discover anything new. Yes, this is. It has very short wings, although they're also quite like the the wings. You can see that they're staying to the front and everything. And it also is a lifting uh, body surface. So the while most airplanes are round at the bottom, the shuttle is completely flat, giving it extra lift. It's not as effective as a full wing, but still quite good. But it's also quite wide. It, it has a very large uh, cross-sectional area from the front. So it's going to experience a lot of drag. Uh, so yeah, no matter wh which way you cut it, the, the shuttle is going to be losing energy quickly to the forces of drag. But is that a problem? Well, not really, and this is why. So the, the shuttle starts in orbit, and that means it's uh, 400 kilometers in altitude, thereabouts, depending on the mission, and also moving at over 7,000 meters per second. So what does this mean for energy? Well, it means we have a large amount of potential energy and a huge amount of kinetic energy. Like it starts with energy to spare. And more importantly, it actually has to uh, put effort into losing all of this energy before getting to the ground, because reaching the ground with such huge amounts of energy usually means ends in the crater, basically. So yeah, for the most part, drag is actually a friend to the shuttle. In fact, when the shuttle starts reentry, it doesn't like dive into the atmosphere like a normal plane. It pretty much belly flops it. It's going at a 40 degree angle of attack against the flow of uh, the atmosphere. And this is because, especially in the upper reaches of the atmosphere, that it's quite sparse. Uh, they're trying to present as much area to the atmosphere as possible without losing control uh, and uh, slow down before they reach uh, the denser portions of the of the atmosphere because if not they're going to burn up so yeah they uh, they like their drag they really need to use the drag to slow down but then at some point when it comes to the approach and landing they have the problem that it's they're bleeding energy too quickly uh, but they don't really need to cover like the, the whole re-entry re -entry is planned according to the distance that it's going to fly with its specific uh, profile so if you say well it can't glide as far because it's so on aerodynamic when they just start re-entry closer to the target and that's it so r range is not really an issue for the for them um also time spent is not really an issue they just want to get in the ground they just they don't want to fly around and do an air show so the only thing is that uh of course being such a so un aerodynamic its stall speed is i i didn't i should have looked this up but uh it's still the stall speed of a shuttle is quite high a lot higher than the than any normal glider of course but i mean it just means that uh you have a you come in a bit hot for landing that's it uh these are not like amateur pilots that just got a, a flying license for uh, leisurely flying around in a glider they trained for this specifically and uh faster than average landing is not really among their problems And you can actually see evidence of this in the glide slope of the shuttle. And you will see it in, uh, of course, it's really hard to measure it uh, when you see the video, especially since they're usually zoomed in on the shuttle when it's coming to land. But you can plainly see like normal uh, glide slope, 
so that that's the angle with respect to the horizontal at which the airplane is approaching the runway for normal aircraft it's around three degrees while the shuttle was around 20 degrees it needed to um, to come down faster well no, more steeply so that the force of gravity well the acceleration due to gravity would compensate for the loss of speed due to drag and it it did that quite nicely there were just um, the rate of descent on the shuttle on its glide slope was around the same as the uh, rate of descent of a skydiver in freefall so it just meant that uh, before getting to the runway they had to pull up a little bit uh, to contract the descent speed it would mean that uh, they start losing speed like crazy but they're already pretty much at the runway so they can touch down safely so now I would hear you say like yes the shuttle uh, technically it could land like that but it had to uh, land much faster than normal which makes it a risk could they not have made it a better glider after all now it gets millions and millions uh, and well first thing is the amount of money NASA makes it sounds like a lot to, for a normal person but if you consider that uh, amount of money it costs to put things into orbit the fact that they la pa have to pay their launch providers and such the amount of employees that they have and everything they really don't get that much money but let's assume let's assume they were extremely uh, over budget like uh, the military or something at some point no, no amount of money is going to help you break the laws of physics so let's see if they had all the money in the world what they could have done to improve the gliding abilities of the shuttle keeping in mind that first and foremost it's a spacecraft designed to put stuff in orbit so if we go back to here well we saw that uh, uh, basically one of the big problems for uh, aircraft is how massive it is the more mass it has, the more lift that the wings need to produce before it uh, it stalls. So yes, one obvious thing would be uh, make it lighter. And this is one that I can assure you, if they could have made it lighter, they would have. Uh, I think nowadays there are lighter materials that can withstand re-entry than was used uh, in the space shuttle. But they didn't have it back then. And it's in their interest because mass is key in any space mission the lighter you can make a spacecraft and it still uh, can withstand the launch and re-entry the better so this is one that uh, if they could have used a lighter material they would have but re-entry is quite harsh and that had to go into consideration uh, then there's another obvious one just add engines and that was actually considered. Some of the design iterations of the shuttle uh, did uh, include um, jet engines. However, jet engines have mass and quite a lot of it. So if you add a, and they're also quite useless for launch. So if you add a engines then you have to subtract that mass from the actual payload. And one of the main reasons that the shuttle eventually went for a glider was um, still in the design phase it was already over budget it went through a lot of different uh, iterations of design and everything and the u.s air force uh, told them they would uh, give them more money but they needed to have a specific uh, capacity of payload into orbit because they they wanted a launcher for some um, heavy reconnaissance satellites or something of the sort so if they added the uh, jet engines to a shuttle then they would not have been able to put this um, uh, these satellites into orbit and the air force would not fund them so yeah that's one consideration uh, another one is 
well, make it sleek. We saw earlier that the uh, a glider is quite sleek in its design, while the shuttle has a big, fat nose. So you could make this body thinner, but that also means you make the cargo bay thinner. And a lot of the things that the shuttle put into orbit were pretty snug inside the cargo bay. Like, probably the cobbles, probably one of the most uh, important missions from the shuttle. And I think the total diameter of it with with uh, the solar panels panels uh, not extended, obviously, was around 4.3 meters, and the diameter of the cargo bay was 4.7 meters, something like that. So not a lot of wiggle room. Also, the a lot of the components of the ISS, uh, from what I've seen, were fit quite snugly inside. So yeah, you could make the body thinner, but then no more ISS components, no more shuttle, and that's basically the entire legacy of the shuttle. So yeah, that's not going to fly. Uh, another thing that could be done is, uh, well, extend the wings to let, uh, make the stall speed uh, lower. And that's probably the most common complaint that I hear people say, like, the wings are too small for it to be a glider. And two things with this. First of all, uh, wings, although it's not as a, a significant amount as, say, jet engines, uh, increasing the size of the wings increases the mass, and you have to take that mass off from the payload. But even then also, if you extend uh, the wings farther, like longer wingspan, in the re-entry, when the shuttle is uh, belly flopping into the atmosphere, the w it provides stress on the joints of the wing. Uh, basically, the airflow is pushing the wings a little further back, and it pr presses the put it, ah, puts pressure on the on the joints here from of the wing with the rest of the orbiter. Also, if you know like the equation of torque, you'd know that uh, the same amount of force exerted further away from the joint point increases the amount of torque. So basically, if you make the wings a lot longer, you run the risk of them just snapping off in the reentry. And then the shuttle is going to be a lot worse of a glider than it is right now. That That's possible, yes. Uh, so yeah, that's also out of the question. And then finally, you could make it uh, like more of an aerodynamic shape. It's still uh, leave the size of the body intact, but make it more pointy. The nose of the shuttle was quite blunt for an aircraft. Uh, but this actually has its purpose, and it's related to do with uh, the aerodynamics of uh, re-entry. So one of the common misconceptions of re-entry is that uh, the heat produced is because of friction. And it's commonly given that as a dumb, dumb explanation, and I really don't like it. It's not friction that is creating the heat. Uh, basically, the shuttle slams into the atmosphere, and the air, before the air is, has a chance to move around it, it gets seriously compressed right in front of it. And from the ideal gas law, if you start compressing uh, the same amount of uh, volume of uh, gas, you're going to increase its pressure a lot. So this gas under tremendous pressure is then getting really heated up. The interesting thing about this is that um, due to how the flow of the gases builds up, you actually get two layers, one layer of really hot gas, but then in between that and the actual object uh, doing re-entry, there's a layer of less uh, hot gas and it acts a little bit as a little bit of an insulator and it turns out that the thickness of this layer depends on the radius of curvature of the surface uh, pressing against it so a very like pointy object has a very small radius of curvature 
therefore this layer is going to be quite thin and the object is going to be more exposed to the uh, temperature of the high uh, of the really hot gas if you make it blunter you increase this uh, gap and decrease the convection of uh, of heat so yeah if you could make the shuttle point here but then you run the risk of uh, it burning up scott manley actually goes uh, gives a great explanation uh, of this in his video about the thermodynamics of reentry so if you would like more information of that then uh, I would encourage you to go look his uh, video up. So that's really all the things I can think of that could, could have made this a better glider. And I reiterated uh, aerodynamics is not really my forte. This is uh, this is about the extent of my knowledge. And uh, if at any point I have been talking out of uh, out of ignorance or something, I welcome corrections. And also, if anybody has any ideas on how they could have made it a better glider. Uh, yeah, but in the end, the shuttle had uh, two accidents. And there were other cases that they, it had like uh, problems during the mission. But they were never in the gliding back part. Uh, like, it never had a problem with a landing. At, at most, I think, there was one landing where it sort of did a wheelie after touching down. But... Uh, that's not a problem with uh, it being a bad glider, it's just it was actually generating too much lift. Uh, so yeah, there's absolutely no reason for for it to be designed like with uh, gliding in mind. It, it performed its mission well. And uh, yeah, the only requirement that it needed for this was to have lots of energy, which it did. So yeah, that's my explanation why it did not matter if the shuttle was a bad glider or not. Uh, it has, it all has to do with energy. And uh, if you have some aerodynamic surfaces, if, you, if you're traveling fast enough, then you, you will have control. I think I've seen even uh, while I was doing my research for this, I found a... Uh, I think it was an Air Force uh, vehicle, not designed to go into orbit, but it was. It did not have wings. It was just a lifting surface and uh, some control surfaces, and that's it. And already tested and landed, so yeah. No, no need to for a very fancy air show glider. Just come back down and do a safe landing. Doesn't have to be even a comfortable landing, like from the videos I've seen the shuttle uh, the, especially the nose wheel came down quite hard uh, but yeah you know, another thing that uh, flat earthers are like oh this doesn't look right conspiracy let's just not look into any of this at all um, no uh, the shuttle had a lot of problems but none of them were aerodynamic and yeah, unfortunately, in the end, uh, it was considered a failure. It uh, was considerably more expensive than it should have been, especially the refurbishing. Uh, it was also not the safest aircraft for lack of a escape tower, or basically not having any options of uh, abort while the solid rocket boosters are running. And yeah, unfortunately, as sad as I am that uh, that it is no longer flying because the the launches of the shuttle are particularly nice in my opinion. I still think it was uh, the right move to cancel it. Uh, but hopefully, it will serve as a stepping so stone for other winged uh, spacecraft in the future. Like already the. The Dream Chaser is being working worked on, and also the Skyland, which I haven't seen any news about it recently, but hopefully it's still on its way. And uh, yeah, it's going to be even more things for the Flat Earthers to call fake. Even though the Skyland will will be powered descent uh, flying, 
they'll probably still complain that the wings are too small or something like that I don't know but yeah I hope uh, everybody found this interesting um, again if uh, if I made some uh, mistakes in the aerodynamics, I'm open to being corrected. Um, if your correction is you're an idiot, it obviously couldn't glide, look, just look at it, I probably won't take you seriously. Anyway, uh, until the next episode where we take a look at if the technology from the uh, moon landing has gone backwards or not. Goodbye.